Go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church. And as always, I am thankful and grateful to see each and every one of you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew 22. We're going to be starting in verse 23 this morning. Last week, we celebrated Easter by, of course, talking about the resurrection of Jesus and all of the implications that its factuality has on our lives as we live in God's world under His authority. We saw 10 people baptized in light of their faith last Sunday with the reality that everyone that turns from sin to trust in Jesus will be redeemed and reconciled with God for all of eternity. And today we're going to jump back into our series going through the entire book of Matthew, uh, finding ourselves in chapter 22. And we're going to talk about a section of verses that uh, has uh, caused some some questions for a lot of people, and which Jesus answers some particular questions about the resurrection hope that we have in Him. And He's speaking to a group of men who denied the possibility of human resurrection. Matthew 21 and 22, those two chapters cover a tense discourse between Jesus and the religious rulers of His day. Different factions of leaders were seeking to trick Jesus into saying something that they could arrest him for, that they could kill him for. And so at first we see him having a tense standoff with the chief priests as he clears the temple. Then the Pharisees have a a few questions for him in which he answers with parables. And then they fail to trip him up. So they send a group called the Herodians to ask him a question. They fail to trip him up. And so this week they send a different group, and that is the group of men that were referred to as the Sadducees. And in all of these attempts, by all of these unbelieving groups, what we ultimately see always rise to the top is the issue of authority. As these people that should know that they need to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, instead ask questions in a way, trying to get Jesus to submit to their authority, trying to get Jesus to admit, submit, kind of, kind of give in to what they believe is their right place as the ultimate authority over the people of Israel. And it's most obvious in verses 23 through 33 that we're going to cover this morning. that These men ask Jesus a question seeking to trip him up about the very nature of the work that he would accomplish just a few days later on the cross and in the resurrection. You know, I hate to tell you this, but there is such a thing as a bad question. And these men are going to ask a bad question because they're not seeking to have a question answered because of they are actually curious. Instead, they ask a question in such a way to seek to openly mock Jesus and mock the reality of the resurrection hope that he was going to give us. And so there's an important distinction that we see in this text that it is important to think beneath the questions that are asked, even in this passage, in order to consider the motivations of the questions that are being brought to Jesus Christ. And we see in this text that everyone brings presuppositions into their questions. This is especially true here as God has given a clear standard that He offered to these people through revelation, and they had rejected it on the basis that it did not meet their standards of what they thought religion should be. And because of that, they're they're questioning everything about the reign of Jesus Christ. The Sadducees bring a motivation of seeking to force Jesus to submit to their standard. And what you'll ultimately see in this passage is that Jesus will not bow down to these men. Start reading in verse 23 of Matthew 22. And it says, the same day. So Jesus is having just a line of different groups bringing him questions over and over again. Must have been taxing. The same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And so what you need to understand there is Matthew is beginning with a statement about their false beliefs. And so Matthew begins this section by saying, this was not a group of trustworthy men. This was a group of men who were seeking to insert false doctrine into the truth of God. And they asked him a question, verse 24, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us, the first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. 
After them, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. And I want to pause there. And I want to talk about the basis of the question that they're asking. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a right way to read God's word and there's a wrong way to read God's word. There is a way to read this and and you're sitting there acting like the Riddler is in front of you, asking you an unanswerable question. And so you will go to the logical conclusions and say, oh my goodness, has they found inconsistency with God? No. And that's why once we get to the end, you'll see Jesus never even answers the question. Jesus rejects the entire hypothesis of their question, going to the root of the presuppositions that they bring into the question, rather than dealing with the merits. Jesus looks and he says, I just reject the entire thesis of your question. I'm going to deal with the real issue going on here. And that reveals to us a vital element in evangelism, in defending the faith, is that there is an important strategy to think beneath the questions and statements that people will give you to seek to understand the real motivation behind their statements. Number one this morning, you need to understand that Scripture has one meaning and you must submit to it. Scripture has one meaning and you must submit to it. When Jesus thinks beneath their question, he ultimately gets to the issue of God's authority and human bias. In understanding this section, it's vital to understand the context of who these Sadducees were. Historians note that these were a group of rich aristocrats within Judaism. They controlled the temple and the daily operation of the priesthood and had turned it into a wealthy operation. These were men of great power. These were men of great influence. These were men that enjoyed wealth. They enjoyed their status. They enjoyed the fact that they controlled everything that went on inside of the temple. And so when Jesus clears the temple, Jesus upsets their business. Jesus upsets that which they presumed to have ultimate authority over. And these were men who actually unbiblically controlled the entire priesthood that worked inside of the temple of God, even to the point where it's most, most of the time understood that the chief priest, the high priest rather, of that day was a Sadducee or was at least put in position by the Sadducees for the distinct purpose of protecting the money operation that God stood completely against. And a large amount of what would become the false teaching from the Sadducees was put into place in order to protect the businesses and the strategies that they put forward. Now, the Sadducees accepted the first five books of the Old Testament as God's word, but rejected anything else from the Old Testament that did not match their agenda in leadership. Now, the Sadducees rejected the idea of the afterlife altogether. So you see that while they would say, well, we accept what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, we accept it. There's no way that their rejection of the other books would not impact their interpretation of those first five books. The reason that they rejected all the other books is because It stood in the way of what they wanted religion to be defined by. It stood in the way of their strategy of what they thought life should be. Stood in the way of their power. Stood in the way of their wealth. And so they just rejected that outright, but then carried into their view of the first five books of the Bible, the fact that they would say, this is the word of God. They reinterpreted the five books under the presuppositions that they already had. There's a difference between saying, I believe that the Bible is God's word and actually dealing with what's inside of God's word. You have to understand that people can say a lot of things that sound good, but the truth of their beliefs is actually shown by how they use the Bible, how they view the actual verses in it, whether or not they accept what biblical doctrine actually is. And the logical conclusion of all of their lies reduce everything to what is right in front of us in this physical world. 
And so they rejected the afterlife. They rejected most supernatural ideas. They rejected the concept of resurrection, even though all of them are all throughout the first five books of the Bible. They're all throughout the Old Testament. All throughout God's Word is implicit about all of these things. They even, as Jesus is going to point out in a minute, they reject the existence of angels, as constantly pointed to in the Old Testament. They reject all of these things, not because they had an academic or spiritual or intellectual issue with it, it was because of their sin. You will ultimately, if you love your sin, if you want to protect the basis by which you are forming your life and you find that God's word contradicts how you are living, you've got one or two choices. Change the way you're living or reinterpret the Bible, which ultimately will lead you to reject the Bible. And so they rejected an afterlife because they didn't want to be held accountable for what they were doing in this physical life. When you reduce everything to what is right in front of your face and say nothing exists after this, that frees you up to an enormous amount of immorality. That frees you up to reinterpret what you are allowed to do, what you have authority over in this world. Because if there is no judgment, then I can't be held accountable. These men did not want to be held accountable for the life that they were living. So rather than repent, they said, oh, the Bible doesn't actually mean... Oh, there's no afterlife. There's no judgment. There's no resurrection. There's nothing other than what is in this world. So they reduced everything to this physical world. And that will ultimately take you to a place of nihilism very quickly. Nihilism, of course, is the thought that nothing really matters. Since there's nothing after this, since there's no point in this, nothing matters. Do whatever you want. Do whatever feels right. Do whatever you think. Because there is no purpose. There is no meaning. And why did these men do this? simply because of sin. So many people will bring objections to Christianity, but time and time again, you can always reduce it to one key motivation, that is protecting the sin in their lives. These men were literally thieves. Their desire for earthly power, their desire for wealth, led them to deny anything in Scripture that would remind them of the judgment that they would incur under the wrath of God for their sin. Friends, theological liberalism is not new. It's been around before the days of Jesus. Reinterpreting the Bible to meet your standards is not something that has just happened in the last 200 years. It's something that's as old as sin. From the first moment where Satan looks at Adam and Eve and says, has God really said? That was the first theologically liberal statement ever made in the world. It's a seeking to reinterpret the Bible according to your standards rather than submitting to God's standard. It is an attempt to form religion on the basis of man rather than God. Friends, you have to understand that Scripture has one meaning and it isn't rooted in how you feel about the text. Now, because in our world today, we have so many false ideologies that people are seeking to synergize with the Christian faith, that statement that Scripture has one meaning has become a very controversial statement because people want to reinterpret Scripture under new lenses of culture all the time. That is why there are so many proponents that are seeking to apply the tenets of all different forms of critical theory with Christianity. But you can't do that. That's what the Sadducees were trying to do. Their denial of the resurrection is the same thing as trying to apply the immorality of systems of power into Scripture where it isn't actually there. There's nothing new under the sun, friends. In 2 Peter, the apostle Peter warns us, starting in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, he says, Knowing this first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but God spoke, excuse me, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, most people stop there, but I think chapter 2, verse 1 tells us something very important. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now you see, this is very clear. What's the meaning of Scripture? Whatever God intended it to be. That's why when you read the Bible and you say, this is what it means to me. Well, friend, you've already gone off base. You've already gotten off track. It doesn't matter what the Bible means to you. It doesn't matter what the Bible means to me. 
When you begin to put your interpretive lens on top of Scripture, you are very quickly going to get a doctrine that is self-seeking, that is selfish, that is you protecting what comes natural to you. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what your emotional state is when you're reading the Bible. It doesn't matter what your personality type is. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, anything under the sun. It doesn't matter your Enneagram profile. It doesn't matter your disc profile. It doesn't matter what any stupid personality test that you're using to try to defend whatever love language you feel applies to you this week. How you feel about the text is the least of your concerns. First, you start with what does God mean by this text? And you find that out by saying, what was going on in history at the time that this was written? What's going on grammatically in this text? What is going on through the theological prism that the scripture as a whole gives us? What did the original author intend to say in this moment? Because it was God speaking through him. The original audience matters and it meant one thing from God through a human author to those people, and it's our job as followers of Jesus to submit to that meaning. When you begin to treat the Bible as chicken soup for the soul, that it must inspire you with whatever you're dealing with this morning, how you woke up, whether you had a headache, whether you felt good, whether you were happy, whether you were sad. Well, right there, you've got 32 different meanings of every verse in the Bible depending on your mood. And guess how many of those mattered? Zero. None of them. The Bible has one meaning, and that should not be a controversial statement in our age. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 tells us that's how false doctrine comes. That's what false teachers come to tell us. They come and submit their cultural, contextual moment on an ageless scripture to try to redefine God's words, and we do not have the authority to do that. God does, in the Old Testament, present human life as eternal. And so that's why Matthew points out that these men didn't believe in the resurrection, and that's why they ask a question about the resurrection, because they didn't believe that it existed. But in Psalm 49, 15, the sons of Korah write, but God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. Now, in the Old Testament, when they say the power of Sheol, they're talking about the power of the grave. They're talking about what's underneath the earth. They're talking about being in a tomb. But it says, for he will receive me. The sons of Korah are saying, there's something that happens after death. I'm going to meet God. And then uh, the prophet Daniel in Daniel 12 2, God spoke through him and said that there is everlasting life after death. And that's only possible in the resurrection. It says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. He's talking about the Sadducees in the second part of that text. He's saying, you're going to rise, but you're going to rise to shame and everlasting contempt. These men denied the clear teachings of Scripture to seek to form a religious authority of their own making. Friends, I'll tell you, that's a heinous sin and it must be rejected. Nothing good lies on the other side of that. It's all evil. Now you may respond, yeah, but Steve, the Sadducees rejected the book of Psalms. The Sadducees rejected the book of Daniel. So wouldn't it be more helpful to get to their level and quote something that they actually believe? But isn't that really the point? These men rejected these texts at their own peril. Their disbelief in it doesn't make it any less true. There is no authority above the authority of God's word. Those that reject it do so at the peril of their own eternity. And so when people advocate and say, you shouldn't use the Bible because that's not effective evangelism. You have to meet people where they are intellectually, where they are academically. So you should appeal to other philosophies in order to show that Christianity is actually cohesive with all sorts of different philosophies under the sun. Friend, whatever you appeal to outside of the Bible for your apologetic stances, your saying has more authority than God's word. Whatever you appeal to outside of it to show its validity is you appealing to something that you're telling everyone has more authority than God's word. And you say, but people might not like that. What do I care what people like? God's given me a word. It's my job 
to humble myself under it and submit to it. And I do not show a submission to God's word by appealing to all the different false ideologies under the sun. Friend, if you spend your whole life studying all the different stupid philosophies that exist in this world because of pagans and sinners, you're never going to get to understanding the Bible in the first place. So you're not going to be able to do anybody any good. This is where you root yourself down in because this is the only text in the world that God himself wrote. This is the only text on earth that God says has supernatural power to take someone from a sinner to someone who is saved by God's grace. God uses this in supernatural ways, but he doesn't promise to use anything else in supernatural ways. It doesn't mean we don't seek to understand, but it does mean we put our flag in God's word and we are immovable. If you have a problem with the Bible, if you disbelieve the Bible, I'm going to act like Jesus acts. I'm going to root myself into it. And I'm going to give that straight to you. Number two this morning, you need to understand that twisting God's words always will, excuse me, twisting God's words will always leave you lost. I create tongue twisters on accident sometimes. Twisting God's words will always leave you lost. Look at what Jesus says in verse 29. But Jesus answered them, and I'm glad he did. Because Jesus gives us a principle for how we stand on God's words and how we treat people who blaspheme his name. Jesus is so winsome. Jesus is so empathetic with them. Jesus meets them right where they are. He starts with my favorite words in the world. You are wrong. <laughs> Jesus doesn't pretty it up. Jesus doesn't soften the blow. Jesus doesn't follow the evangelistic principles of 2022. Jesus doesn't go to them and try to understand their love language, their personality type, their Enneagram. Jesus doesn't ask them what their love language is. Jesus doesn't ask them what kind of day that they had. Jesus just said, hey, there's truth and you aren't there. <laughs> Jesus looks at them and he confronts them with their foolishness. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, you are wrong. Why? Because you, not, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. I have not seen much less of a winsome answer very many places. He confronts him. He says, first, you're wrong. He cares more about what God's word said than what the world thinks. Jesus confronts the world. He destroys their arguments by exposing the foolish nature of them. Then secondly, he goes to a group of very religious men. And he says, you're not just wrong. You don't even know the Bible. And you don't just not know the Bible. You don't even know the power of God. And what Jesus means by that is you don't believe in an afterlife because you know God won't be there when you get there because you're going to hell. Jesus says you're wrong, you don't know the Bible, and you don't know the God of the Bible. Now, friends, that is an evangelistic strategy I can get behind, all right? <laughs> that meets my love language all day, all right? Jesus isn't worried about that. Jesus is worried about the integrity of his word. Jesus is worried about the integrity of his authority. Jesus is not going to stoop to their level because God demands these men stoop to his level. The question that the men asked is based on Deuteronomy 25, 5. He says to these men, For in the resurrection, verse 30, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read what was said to you by God? Again, he bookends it with you dummies. Jesus continues to confront them in their error, but Jesus does not submit to the thesis of their question. There is such a thing as a question you shouldn't ask. There is such a thing as a stupid question. Your elementary teacher was wrong. When she looked at you and said, little Timmy, there's no such thing as a stupid question. She lied to you. She did. You can ask a bad question. You can ask a stupid question. And some of you really need somebody to tell you that. You can ask a question and not seek an answer. These men weren't seeking an answer. These men weren't seeking truth. That's a bad question. There are questions that have devious intent. There are also questions that simply are given and meant to cast doubt on the answer. How do we know this is that type of question? Once they get to the third husband... 
you know that they're not looking for an answer. You can usually safely assume that the longer someone's question is, the less likely they're looking for a real answer for it. You can assume at some point, I've had people ask me questions that took them five minutes to get out. Halfway through, it stopped being a question. It started being a sermon at me. And I realized they don't have a question. They want to prove a point. And that's what these men are doing. They're taking the Old Testament law, Deuteronomy 25.5, and they're using it to cast doubt on the resurrection. But they don't understand the basis of the question, and that's why, the basis of the law, that's why Jesus just completely rejects the thesis behind it. Jesus looks at them and says, they don't want to know about protecting widows in the Old Testament, which is the basis of this. You don't want to leave a widow destitute once her husband dies. So the family needs to come in. She needs to marry into that family. The seed of the brother needs to go on so that there will be an inheritance for her to be taken care of in life. That's the basis of much of the Old Testament law is making sure people don't go destitute. But instead, they turn it into a caricature of how there is no resurrection. Because wouldn't that be silly if she gets to heaven and there's seven different husbands waiting for her, Jesus? Aren't you stupid, Jesus? When somebody comes to you with a question about your faith and you realize halfway through the question they're trying to make Jesus look bad, feel no need to soften the blow of the answer. Because you don't need to submit to their premise, they need to submit to God's premise. And that's what Jesus does. See, if these men had had a well-intentioned question for Jesus, they would have come to him with a question about the basis of God's law in Deuteronomy 25. But that's not what they do, is it? No. So Jesus feels no responsibility. He feels no reason to actually look to them and deal with the basis of their question. Instead, Jesus openly mocks these men because they were seeking to create a caricature of God's word in an attempt to make the afterlife and all of the implications of it look silly. These men were wrong because they didn't know God's word. Friends, you need to take away from that that God isn't trying to measure up to your standard of proof. God isn't trying to measure up to your standards. He's calling you to submit to His standards. They were seeking to get Jesus to stoop to their level, but Jesus doesn't have to agree with their hypothesis because He is the writer of the law. He's the authority of the law. So His answer comes as one who has authority. And that's where so many go wrong with the way that they think about evangelism, even the way that they think about defending the Christian faith in a secularized and materialistic atheism-based society. The attempt to make Christianity acceptable to those that deny its rationale is a fruitless endeavor. It will not work. We do not invite people in to see how Christianity meets their standard of proof. That removes the authority from God and it lays it at their feet. And ultimately, Jesus isn't begging for the approval of sinful men. Sinful men need to seek the approval of God. Sinful men need to look at the standards of God. Sinful men must humble themselves under the hand of a mighty God. Instead, the key is an understanding that sinful men need to submit to Him. That is why Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 is so vital in applying your understanding at the intersection of doctrine and missional living. The author of Hebrews says this way, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. A lot of times we'll say verse 12, but we ignore verse 13. Verse 12 leads into verse 13 because verse 12 says, here's where the authority comes from and here's the outcome of your rejection of that authority. All of your arguments will be destroyed. You will be laid bare. You will be as though naked in front of a holy God and you will be judged by Him. At the judgment seat of Christ, God will not entertain your objections. When God comes... When he takes us home, when we stand before him in judgment, he's not going to say, okay, you have the floor. And you're not going to be able to open the Bible and say, hey, 
This doesn't measure up to my standards. So you prove to me what this means and why this is true. I'm waiting, Lord. You will be speechless on that day. You will be held accountable to whether or not you trusted him or whether or not you rejected him. And a holy and righteous sovereign Lord will not entertain your foolish objections. He's not asking whether you understand. He's demanding that you submit to him and all that he has revealed to you. Friends, knowledge is not neutral. Biblical knowledge is the power from God that the Holy Spirit uses to change lives. When people twist God's words into blasphemous caricature, the only proper response is to reject that hypothesis. God doesn't beg for our approval. The atheistic delusions that create materialistic philosophies, they deserve ridicule as they are impotent attempts to steal God's authority. That is why Jesus mocks these men as blasphemers. Never forget that it is God who has all authority in heaven and earth. It is not sinful man. We do not submit to their rationale. I do not invite people to come in and say, use your standards, use your philosophies, use your sin, and go to God's word and then see how it measures up. See how rational it is. See how logical it is. See how you need to accept it because it meets every standard you have. That would be giving them the authority. That would be treating them as God. That would be demeaning to the authority of Jesus Christ saying, just you don't worry, Jesus will submit to your reign over him. Never going to happen, friends. It's never going to happen. Anyone that twists God's word will always be lost. We must treat God's words as though it is true. We shouldn't look in this book and be ashamed of anything that it says. Because it's all from the authority of God. It all meets his standards. It's all about him. And man must submit to to it. That's why you need to understand a vital thing about studying the scriptures. I would assume that there is something in the Bible, might be different for some of you, but there's something in the Bible that every one of you don't understand. There's something in there. You look at it, you read it, you say, whew, I haven't reached that level of a hermeneutics yet. I don't know what he's talking about. You probably read this and you're just so distracted by which husband She's going to be following through heaven. And you're like, man, I don't have an answer to that question either. Well, here's the deal. You don't need to understand everything in the Bible. You simply need to trust that God does. That's the key. I make it my aim to seek to understand everything that I can in this word because God's going to judge me because I'm teaching his word. Therefore, I'll be held accountable for every word that I ever teach. But I'll be honest with you. I, the Apostle Peter looks at the writings of Paul and he writes in his letters. He looks to the church that's in the, in the dispersion and he says, if you're struggling with the letters of Paul, so am I. That's an apostle saying, I don't always understand what God's saying through that other apostle, but that's okay. Because what did Peter trust? Peter trusted God. Peter didn't trust Paul. Peter trusted God. You do not have to submit to my standard. You need to submit to God's standards. Make it your aim to be a student of the word, but at the end of the day, you trust the God of the word and you trust that he has it figured out even if I don't have it figured out. Where we go wrong is since I can't figure it out, I put my interpretation on top of it. You're not allowed to do that. You don't have the authority for that. The key of this text is understanding number three, trusting God will always lead to eternity. Trusting God will always lead to eternity. He is the God of the living. He looks to these men, he said, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven, verse 31. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? I love that he says that. He looks at it, he says, I'm gonna answer a question you're not even asking me, boy. He says, have you not read? What was said to you by God, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Why does he take this approach since so many would tell us you can't argue someone into the kingdom of heaven? Because Jesus sounds pretty argumentative in this passage for two reasons. 
The first one is, yes, you can argue someone into the kingdom of heaven. I'm not saying it's going to be a yelling match, but if you're sitting in here and you have faith in Jesus Christ, someone argued you into the kingdom of heaven. They told you the good news and it convinced you of its truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Everyone that's going to heaven was argued into it. Every single person. But secondly, it's vital that you understand that that I take Jesus at his word because he wasn't just communicating with unbelievers in this passage. There were many other people surrounding Jesus as he talked, and his answer is the answer of a shepherd protecting his sheep. Discipleship is very, very doctrinal. And so Jesus is combating with false teachers so that the sheep who were following him would know that Jesus just destroyed the arguments of false teachers. That's the role of a shepherd, and that's the role in this passage that Jesus took. He was protecting his sheep. Now, I've alluded to this, but don't get distracted by the statement about marriage in heaven. If that's all you can think about in this passage, friend, repent of your sin and trust the words of Jesus Christ. I take Jesus at his word. That's as far as I go right there. Our relationships in heaven will obviously be different than they are right here and right now. All right. And so if you're thinking, but I want to be married to him forever. Well, too bad if God doesn't want you to be. At least you get this world. All right. Now, some of you are like, oh, thank God. Now, I got nothing for you if you're saying that this morning, all right? You might want to come get some counseling from Pastor James. I don't know, all right? But Jesus is telling us that we'll be like the angels. So he's telling the Sadducees, his angels exist. He's saying marriage will be reformed. It will be different. Marriage, according to Jesus, is a covenant for this life only. And so in heaven, it will be different. And so if you are so obsessed with this to say, Steve, but what will it be like? You know what I have to say? I don't know. I've never been to heaven. When I get there, I guess I'll find out. My wife might live in the house next door. She might live in my house. She might live three doors down. I don't know. I trust God to make that decision for me. Why? Because he loved me to the extent that his son died for my sins and then he rose from the dead to give me a new life. And so I give him a lot of leeway in the decision-making process. I give him a lot of margin. It's up to him. It's not up to me. But in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So whatever he decides is going to be the best possible decision for me. He is God. I am not. But that isn't Jesus' focus. Jesus' focus is on being the God of the resurrection. He tells these men, if God is the God of Israel's patriarchs, they must be resurrected. Jesus quotes Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 to these men. He quotes a book that they claim to accept as God's word. In Exodus 3, 6, it says, God said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at the Lord. Now, what is he saying in this text? Do you realize Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of them were dead by Exodus chapter 3. Yet, in speaking to Moses, God uses the present tense. He says, I am the God. So as he's saying, and what Jesus says is, isn't he the God of the living and not the God of the dead? And so what Jesus is saying is, well, when you look at Exodus chapter 3, understand that God is mentioning three men that he rose from the dead. He's saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive, and they needed to be subjected to the reality that resurrection is something that falls under God's power and ability. And it's so vital to grasp the meaning that just a few days later, Jesus would go to the cross. Just a few days later, Jesus would physically die on that cross. And in objection to everything that these Sadducees missed, three days after Jesus died on that cross, he rose from the dead. Can you imagine being one of those Sadducees and then people looking at you saying, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is over there. Jesus rose. Jesus rose from the dead, winning ultimate victory over death, showing that he is the God of eternity, inviting you to join him in everlasting life, inviting you to join him. 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter that was written 100% about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's what the Apostle Paul says in verse 52 about the future. 
He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised to him, the imperishable, and we shall be changed. He's talking about followers of Jesus right there. He's saying this life is not all that there is. Jesus proves it and Jesus has authority over it. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you trusted in him as your Lord and Savior, there is coming a day, friend, where you will die if the Lord tarries. But he promises that on the other side of that grave, there is a resurrection to that which is imperishable. Yeah. I'm getting older every day, and I feel the perishableness of my body. <laughs> Maybe you're with me. But there's coming a day where I will take up that which is imperishable because of the lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. Friend, you can know that life. Reject the attitude of the Sadducees. Submit to Jesus as God. Submit to all that he proclaimed. He is Lord of all. Is he Lord of your life? A few application points this morning. Number one, every verse in the Bible has one meaning. Every verse in the Bible has one meaning, and the goal of studying the Scriptures is to find it. Secondly, do not twist God's Word. Submit to His Word. Do not twist God's Word. Don't put your meaning on top of it. Thirdly, do not entertain lies as plausible. Never look at someone that doesn't believe the gospel and think to yourself, well, they've got a good reason to believe lies. It doesn't even make sense. If it's a lie, there's no good reason to believe it. I need to give them God's reason to deny the lies and believe the truth of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, live in light of eternity. This life is not all that there is. Live in light of the reality that we will stand before God. And He will look to us to see whether we had faith in Jesus Christ at all. Then fifthly, all who trust Jesus will be raised to imperishable life. All who trust Jesus will be raised to imperishable life. Do you trust Him? Do you know Him? 